uh, even stronger form of uh, PKN principle. Suppose we have, uh, let us say, uh, n. Uh, I think I made a mistake here. This is plus n one plus n two plus n three plus etc plus n k minus k plus one. Okay. So suppose uh, n one plus n two plus n three plus etc n k. So different numbers. I'm just giving minus k plus one balls are put into k boxes. So I have k boxes, and I have some number of balls. Right. This is n one plus n2 plus etc plus nk minus k right from each i am subtracting one and then i am just putting one extra right so you know this is basically n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1 plus n3 minus 1 plus nk minus 1 plus 1 this many whatever that number is that many balls i am going to throw into each of the different boxes k boxes then either the first box has n1 balls or maybe that is not the case then the second has n2 balls even that if that is not the case third box has n3 balls or something up to kth box has nk balls one of these must be true now all of them cannot be false altogether right because if the first one had only n1 minus 1 second had only n2 minus 1 etc last one had nk minus 1 in total we have only n1 plus n2 plus nk minus k, the plus 1 will be missing. So therefore, one of them must satisfy this. So now this gives, you know, more structure, right? We are saying that the first one now I can quantify and say that, okay, this has n1 minus n1 or this has n2 or this has n3 or etc. I mean, I can change the order also. I can say that, you know, first one has n2, second one has n1, doesn't matter. But this is something we can, we can do. And we can use it uh, to prove more uh, interesting results. So here is a simple, very simple example. So we have we have a you know drawer in the house, right? You know, and then this drawer contains uh, socks of different colors. You know, every day I you know I go out. I want to let's say put a matching color for my. Uh, my, my dress right the socks must have some the matching color maybe i don't know so now uh, let us say that i have five red socks seven blue socks and four gray socks now you know one day you go to pick up the socks for the next day morning you want to make it all ready and then you know there is no power or something and then you you know you are picking up the socks from the drawers in the dark so you can't see the color so the question is that how many socks you need to pick to make sure that you have at least two of the same color because you know i don't want to put a red socks on one leg and the blue socks on the other one right so therefore uh, uh, how many you need to pick to make sure that you have at least two of the same color so <clears throat> this is a problem you know very well suited for the generalized version that we are just presenting the strong form so you have uh, you know n1 n2 etc n k minus k plus 1 right so what are these numbers that we need to figure out right what are the balls now we know that you know, the socks are going to be the boxes are going to be the uh, pigeon uh, and uh, the colors are going to be the be the pigeon balls right because we need to pick two of the same color so therefore uh, uh, you know we we can already see that you know two of the same color must fall into one box right so that must be the blue box or red box or gray box so uh, now what are these numbers that we want to talk about so we have a red box we have a blue box and a gray box so we have k is equal to three okay then we have n1 n2 and n3 which says that we need at least you need to guarantee there will be either n1 or n2 or n3 right we need either two of the same color two of the same color two of the same color two red or two blue or two gray one of them right so n1 is equal to n2 is equal to n3 is equal to 2 and therefore by applying the generalized form 
the minimum number of socks you need to pick will be n1 plus n2 plus n3 minus k plus 1 right the same thing that we just saw so what is this this is n1 plus n2 plus n3 which is uh, 2 into 3 6 minus k which is 3 plus 1 which is equal to 4 so if you pick 4 socks then definitely one of them uh, one of the colors uh, there will be two of them right because there will be either two red if it is not there there will be two blue that also is not there there will be two uh, gray so that is it so we are now masters of the whole principle right Now we want to see some really amazing applications of this theorem. We are going to prove uh, a very uh, famous result called Dirichlet theorem. Uh, you know, Dirichlet is the name of a mathematician who proved this for the first time at least. Uh, that's what uh, people believe. And uh, this is uh, this is a result from you know analysis you can say if you want uh, that uh, says the following right you you know you are already familiar with uh, numbers right you have integers you have rational numbers right can be written of the form p by q where q not equal to zero is a, an integer right and uh, then you have uh, real numbers right the real numbers are the extension of uh, rational numbers and uh, you have also numbers which are not rational there, right called irrational numbers. so irrational numbers doesn't have a pyq form right there is no rational form but what Dirichlet theorem says is that every real number has a very good rational approximation that is uh, given any real number and uh, given any epsilon right any any very 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 small number that you give me right like point zero 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 hundred zeros and one or something i can find a, a rational number which is close to this number you know the difference between them will be less than the number that you give me so no matter what's x epsilon you give me i can always find a number even closer so this is the uh, called uh, dirichlet theorem right this is that's a very good rational approximation as good as you want you can make it as small as the difference can be as small as you want so let us state it in a formal way so you have a, uh, a real number x is given and a natural number n you know positive natural number n is given then you can find two uh, numbers p and q where q not equal to zero such that the difference the absolute value of x minus p by q right p by q is a rational number is less than 1 by n times q less than or equal to 1 by q square so 1 by n q means that n can be arbitrarily large which means that 1 by n q will be arbitrarily small you can make it going to zero like as close to zero as you want so the difference can be as close to zero as you want that's what it says now how do you prove something like this using pgn right that is an interesting question so can you prove this i want you to think about this so stop and think about it before you proceed so here is the here is the idea okay that uh, no, when we are talking about uh, real numbers, you know, see, real number always have some, you know, integer part, which is not interesting really, right? Because, you know, that integer part is there. Maybe it is the larger part. But the the fractional part is what is making it interesting. And, and we will start by assuming that since the rational number doesn't need a rational approximation because that, that number is you know itself a rational number so therefore the difference between the best approximation which is itself and that is going to be zero so there is you know this is this part is trivial right 
because this is difference is zero so therefore so we can assume that the number is irrational so for the irrational number the interesting part is the uh, fractional part so let us uh, let us look uh, at the number x given and then look at the fractional part of x. so fractional part of x i rem uh, denote in the uh, 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 flower brackets so this says that i remove the integer part from this right so this is equal to x minus integer part of x <coughs> so <coughs> i take the fractional part now the fractional part is something we know about fractional part is that it is going to be less than one and it's going to be between zero and one right? we are talking about positive for the time other way we can just change the sign it's not a big deal <coughs> so we have a uh, we have a uh, property that it is going to be between zero and one now this uh, inequality gives us a clue okay this inequality maybe I, I shouldn't use this so this one by n cube so one by n is something that we can understand right because you give me n one by n is a very very small number epsilon <coughs> now if i want to show that you know the difference is going to be less than one by n then basically what i am saying is that these two numbers happen to be in an interval of size less than one by n right so this is what uh, we are basically saying right in this interval we have uh, <coughs> we have uh, we have uh, these two numbers right the the number that we are talking about and it's this thing you know they must be as close right so the difference is going to be very small now how do you how do you go about uh, showing this something like this so since we already have a fractional part and i know that it is going to be between 0 and 1 i'm going to subdivide the you know this interval 0 1 into you know n sub intervals like 0 to 1 by n 1 by n to 2 by n etc n minus 1 by n to n i mean uh, n by n which is 1 right so now i want to somehow bring the settings so that two things are going to fall in the same interval. Now, what are these two things? So I need to somehow generate enough things to say that if I want to apply PGN principle, I need to generate at least n plus one numbers to be able to put it into say that two of them are in the same interval, right? I'm going to have n intervals as my PGN holds, then n plus one numbers must be there. So what are these n plus one numbers? So that gives the second clue. So for that, we are going to generate the numbers by using the fact that irrational numbers, uh, you know, even if you multiply with, with a, an integer, it is still going to be irrational. So what I am going to do is that I am going to take, you know, our irrational numbers, x, and then multiply uh, it with uh, numbers, let's say, 1 into x, then 2 into x, and 3 into x etc n plus 1 oh, this is the problem with this uh, etc n plus 1 into x i mean uh, yeah maybe I, ne I need to use the other bracket so i'm going to yes uh, n plus 1 into x with the other bracket right so i have uh, generated now n plus one rational numbers i am looking at the again the fractional part of each of these so i get n plus one different uh, fractional uh, numbers these are all related to x also right so we get a relation and the the interesting part is that the, if you look at the coefficients of what you are multiplied with they are in the range one to n plus one so that the difference is going to be at most n and that is what this uh, uh, 1 by n q and where our q is going to be in fact between 1 less than or equal to q less than or equal to n okay this is an extra condition that you can give if you want okay <coughs> uh, b 
So that gives a, a that is a clue to what is going to be our Q, etc. So what so what we know is that by pigeonhole principle, two of these guys, some AX and BX, right? Some AX and some BX, the fractional part must be belonging to the same interval, whatever some interval. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, so we know that the fractional part of ax and fractional part of bx uh, belong to the same interval so that says that a minus b into x minus the integer part of uh, a minus b into x right that is the fractional part right that difference right this is in the same interval, which means that this is the difference between these two, a minus b into x and the other part of a minus b into x. That difference is uh, less than a is okay is less than uh, one by n because they belong to the same interval. Now, why it's strictly less? Because these numbers can never be in the boundary because they are irrational numbers. And 1 by n, 2 by n, etc. are rational numbers. So the fractional part will never be even the boundary. So it will be strictly inside. So if it is in one interval like this, then we know that they are going to be strictly inside. So the difference is strictly less than 1 by n. Now things are easy. So I am going to put a minus b uh, as uh, <coughs> q. So q into x because a minus b is going to be between 1 and n. Uh, n now because the numbers are from 1 to n plus 1 right so a minus b is equal to q and uh, this integer part of a minus b into x whatever it is to be p okay? it's integer part so that's an integer so qx minus p right less than 1 by n so dividing throughout by q because q is non-zero right i have taken distinct numbers a and b the difference is going to be non zero and uh, it is going to be uh, in the range 1 to n. So, therefore, this is dividing throughout by q. I get absolute value of x minus p over q is less than 1 by n q. But now, because q is in the range 1 to n, this is less than or equal to 1 by q square. And that's what we wanted to prove. So, we have proved the uh, Dirichlet theorem by applying general principle by considering the intervals uh, 0 1 by n etc as the pgn holds and the numbers that we generated right by multiplying this number this and taking the fractional part as the pgns and this is what requires some ingenuity this is what we uh, that uh, that makes the uh, pgn principle difficult to apply because we need to figure out which are the PGNs and which are the PGN holes, and that is not always the easy job. Okay, so I, I hope that you have uh, uh, cleared up the question. If there is any thing, just think about it and let me know. Now, <clears throat> another very, very important result and very, very interesting application. Uh, of the PGN principle. This is uh, Erdos uh, Shakaras theorem. Okay, so uh, this theorem, I mean, we can prove it using the generalized uh, form uh, or the strong form, but I want to use the other form for the time being because it gives a different flavor to it. Right? It gives a different way in approach. It's a very beautiful approach. So the Erdos Shakaras theorem uh, says the following: Suppose you are given uh, n uh, numbers in a sequence, okay? So like you have a1, a2, a3, etc. in some order. Now this n happens to be a number which is uh, greater than or equal to r into s plus one for some positive integers r and s. Okay? So r and s are numbers. R into S plus 1 is some number and n is at least R into S plus 1, maybe larger. <clears throat> now, no matter what the number that you have given me, right? So these are distinct numbers. No matter what you know order 
that you have given me this number, you can show that the sequence contains either an increasing subsequence of r plus 1 times or a decreasing subsequence of s plus 1 times. And what is an increasing subsequence? You, you take the sequence as it is and just remove some of the elements from there. What remains is a subsequence. And if this subsequence, every number right in the sequence, in the order whenever you go to the right, it increases. That is an increasing subsequence. A decreasing subsequence is exactly you take a subsequence, but it decreases each time. Now, what the Erdős Chakras theorem says is that uh, you can find either uh, an increasing subsequence of uh, at least uh, s plus uh, at least r plus one numbers or a decreasing subsequence of s plus one numbers. This is something that you can always do. Now, how do you uh, go about proving something like this? So in the earlier one, suppose we want to use the, uh, you know, the, the first form that we studied, right, rather than the, uh, the general form. Here we have, uh, uh, you know, several, uh, several uh, things that you want to show, right? You want to show either R plus 1 or S plus 1, right? General form allows this, but let's try to use the other form. How do you, can you use the previous form to do this? That requires some thinking. So why don't you pause and think about it? Okay. Now, <clears throat> so to do this, I'm going to, uh, you know, look at the sequence and then do some analysis. Okay. So I want to a n is given. What I'm going to because whatever you are going to give me, I have the collection, right? I want to a. Now I am the one who want you give me the sequence. I will go. Uh, I'm going to show you that I can produce either a decreasing subsequence or an increase subsequence of this many times. Right? So you, you have given me this thing. I am going to look at the sequence and study it. Now what I am going to do is that I count the number of, uh, you know, or the length of the longest increasing subsequence that starts from a number. Okay. Suppose if I look at the position, let us say A2, right. Now if I look at A2, I start from A2 and look at what is the maximum, uh, you know, the subsequence that you can create, which increases. So from A2, after A2, I can only select numbers which are larger than it, right? Then I can select only numbers larger than that, etc. right? So I look at this and see how many I can select. This I can do, right? Whatever, I'm just going to make an argument, right? So I'm going to say that whatever is that number, that I will call as Xi. So Xi is the length of the longest increasing subsequence starting at Ai. Right. So from A2, this is X2. From A3, it is X3, etc. An it is Xn. Right. From A1, it is X1. So I, you know, I have this Xi. Then I also look at the longest decreasing subsequence that ends at Ai. You know, that is the clever part. Okay. So you look at the uh, decreasing subsequence, but not starting from A2. But that ends at A2, right? Not starting at AN, but ending, ending at AN. So what is the longest uh, decreasing subsequence ending at AI? So this is YA. Now what is the property of, uh, or, or the advantage of selecting something like this is that uh, if I, you know, if I look at the number that we are deciding now, right? For corresponding to AI, I have this number as XI and YA. Now, suppose I select any other number, let's say aj, you know, j different from i, right? I have xj and yj. You now, if I look at xi and xj, maybe xi and xj are the same, right? That is possible, right? Because xi uh, is the length of the increasing subsequence starting, starting from uh, xi and uh, I mean AI and uh, XJ is the one starting from AJ. Maybe from you know whatever is the longest sequence starting from AI is the same as the one starting from AJ. That is possible, right? So XI can be equal to XJ. Similarly, YA can be equal to YJ, right? That is also possible, right? For any number, 
you know the decreasing subsequence ending at ai and aj could be the same because after that everything is larger then i cannot do anything right whatever i have selected from ai that is it next one is all smaller i mean larger so i cannot select anything so therefore it can be the same but what i know is that xi yi and xj yj as ordered pair can never be the same why is that so if i select xi comma yi that says that xi is the length of the uh, long uh, largest increasing subsequence starting from ai and yi is the length of the decreasing subsequence that ends at yi now when i go to aj what happens suppose xi does not increase then yj will increase because the numbers are distinct if xi does not increase then yj mean so the, if xi does not increase that means that the number is uh, going to be uh, smaller so therefore yj will increase otherwise if xi increases then yj i mean you know like if, if yj uh, doesn't change then the xi will, will change right one of them will change now because of this as ordered pairs they will never be the same right i mean this number and this this ordered pair and this ordered pair will never be equal as ordered pairs so this is never equal so this helps us to uh, you know design uh, a pigeon hole uh, application so what you do is that we know that these numbers xi and yj can never be more than n because you know maximum number of times is n right so longest increasing subsequence can only be at most n decreasing also can be at most n so i'm going to plot it in a, a graph like you know i take an n by n square then i'm going to put you know the numbers here right you know xi you know so this is the position it's going to the uh, i so that is like uh, you know 1 2 etc up to n and 1 2 etc up to n so this says that you know this is the where i am going to plot x i's and this is where i am going to plot y j's right uh, so how i am going to do that well i take x i y j for any number and whatever is the number i am going to mark it right so this guy this guy this guy whatever i am going to so the corresponding numbers i am going to put here right the ordered pairs x i y j i am going to put if that pair is appearing i am going to put a cross mark wherever it is now what i know is that because uh, n is greater than or equal to r into s plus 1 okay let me look at the sub uh, you know rectangle of size s and r okay if i am going to look at the s into r sub uh, sub rectangle here this rectangle will contain n boxes right this rectangle will contain n boxes because that is s into r boxes are there uh, you know uh, will contain s into r boxes right it can contain only uh, not n boxes it can contain at most s into r boxes but n is greater than s into r right it's at least s into r plus one so therefore even if you fill up all these boxes with rows you will still have some uh, some cross that must appear outside this box it must can appear either here or maybe here or maybe here whatever right now if the you know the cross appearing here means that for some pair x i y j right uh, you know the x i had crossed r right which means that the longest increasing subsequence is greater than r plus one greater than equal to r plus one if it was here yj had crossed s so therefore the longest decreasing subsequence is at least s plus one and similarly if it is here both might have happened right you know, the longest decreasing subsequence as well as increasing subsequence is larger than r plus one and s plus one so these are the uh, possibilities and using the pgn hole principle right if the boxes as the pgn holes and the crosses as the pgns the ordered pairs of the pgn we can show that uh, erdos chakras theorem holds and this is a very 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 beautiful and very ingenious application of the pgn principle right 
Okay. <clears throat> now, time for homework. Uh, I will give you some questions. As I mentioned earlier, you need to look at uh, more questions from the textbook. Uh, I would recommend to go through all the questions and try to solve as many as you can. Uh, but at least try to do you know, half of them, something like that. So here are the homework questions. Uh, first question uh, is, uh, let S be any n plus 1 element subset of the set 1 to 2n. Okay. So you have an n plus 1 element subset of 1 to 2n. So there is a 2n element set, exact precise set 1 to 2n. Show that there are two numbers a and b in S such that a divides b. This is a very classic result of Erdos. Uh, I want you to think about proving this rather than trying to look it online. You will find it very easily online, but don't bother with that, right? Try to try to find out uh, a solution yourself. Uh, and it uh, is it's fun. Okay, believe me, it is going to be challenging, but it will be fun. Now, so this is that any n plus one element subset of the set will contain two elements such that one divides the other. But what is even stronger one can show is that if you take some s element, I mean n element subset, that need not be the case. So give me an example of an n element subset of 1 to 2n, where you cannot find two numbers with this property, right? So that is the first question. Then show that given any positive integer n, there is some integer k such that the digits of uh, k times n, okay? So it's a multiple of n, right? Are a sequence of ones and zeros. We are not talking about uh, you know binary representation because any number has it can be written in sequence of ones and zeros, but not that. In the decimal system itself, I can find you know a multiple, right? Let us say that uh, you take uh, thirty-seven. You know that. 111 is a multiple of 37, right? So this way, uh, but maybe like 117, 111 and 0, right? If you want both 1s and zeros, you can add zeros, of course, right? So I want you to show that uh, there is a, uh, there is always a multiple. No matter what number you give me, you can always find a multiple with uh, all the digits are just 1s and zeros. Another question that uh, is uh, given a sequence a1 to a n of positive integers, show that uh, for some i and j between 1 and n, 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to j less than or equal to n, a i plus a i plus 1, etc., a j is divisible by n. So there is a subsequence of consecutive times whose sum is divisible by n. Okay. So that is the third question. And the fourth question is that, uh, show that if n plus one integers are chosen from uh, the set one to uh, three n, okay? So I, I use this square bracket notation to denote uh, the elements from one to that number, right? Whatever, if k is a positive integer, this says that we are talking about the set one, two, three, et cetera, up to k. Okay, so when I say this, this basically 1 to 3 n, 1, 2, 3, etc. 3 n. So if you look at n plus 1 integers from 1 to 3 n, then there are always two which differ by at most two. Okay. And the next question is that given any set of 52 integers, there exists two of them whose sum or whose difference is divisible by 100. Okay, so now it's slightly different, right? Either the sum or the difference is divisible by 100. So can you show this? It needs little more thinking than the previous one. It's not very difficult. No. And sixth question, given 10 uh, persons whose age is a whole number between 1 and 60, prove that one can find two groups of people disjoint, having the sum of their ages equal. 
okay can we replace 10 with a smaller number yes or no and justify whatever you say right if it is yes you need to give justification if it is no you have to be again give justification 